Good morning, everyone. This is Christina Osborne with ISS Stakeholder Affairs, and I'd like to thank you all for joining the call to go over the real-time settlement review draft final proposal. Um, we did post this proposal out on the initial webpage on October 21st. Um, there's also, we also posted the presentation that we're going to be reviewing uh, a couple of days ago, uh, so look for it out on the initiative webpage. Uh, so we have James Friedrich from Policy. He's the, the lead on this initiative. He's going to um, provide an overview of um, the items that are being proposed in this initiative. And then he and James Lynn from Settlement um, are going to talk about the changes uh, since the last paper in the draft final proposal. And then I'm going to go ahead and go to the next steps. Uh, so also from the ISO who uh, has, have joined us on the line, we have Brad Cooper, uh, Haley Mikeska, Abhishek Kundawali, uh, John Anders, and Heather Kelly. Uh, we may have some others join later. So we are in the draft final proposal phase. Um, the next step is to, actually we're going to be kicking off the tariff process in early November. Um, I'll go over that on the next slide, but uh, we are planning to take this to the EIM governing body in early December and then the uh, Board of Governors in mid-December. Um, and then you can see on the right um, of the slide, uh, we plan to implement the asymmetrical wheeling settlement change in April 2021, and then the um, unaccounted for energy and VCR transfer changes in fall 2021. Oops, a little too fast there. Um, so this is the, the schedule. Uh, like I mentioned, we are going to be starting the, the tariff process. We're going to kick that off on November 5th by posting the draft tariff language. Uh, we will be asking stakeholders to comment before we have the call, so the comments will be due on the draft tariff language on November 17th, and then we'll host a call uh, November 19th to go over any um, input that was received and uh, review the draft tariff language. Um, and again, uh, we plan to go to the EIM governing body and Board of Governors in December. Uh, so. Uh, as always, we, we will be pausing for, for questions throughout the presentation. Uh, so if you do have a question, you can raise your hand by pressing pound two. Uh, please start by introducing yourself. Uh, we are also recording the meeting today. We will make that recording available on the initial webpage uh, probably by early next week. So as soon as we receive it from AT&T, we will make that available. Again, um, we do ask that you reach out to the ISO before reprinting any of the uh, written transcriptions or um, recording. Um, so with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to James Friedrich. Thank you. Next slide, please. So this is slide six, and I thought before we get started, uh, I would uh, remind folks of what we had posted uh, originally in our issue paper and straw proposal to sort of set the stage for the rest of the call. So the issue paper straw proposal uh, consisted of three major elements. The first element was um, our description of some additional metrics that we're uh, completing to assess the real-time settlement process. And so those three metrics related to um, imbalance energy in comparison to uh, the financial value of transfers, uh, a congestion comparison uh, compared to the allocation, and then a real-time offset comparison. And those metrics were described in our issue paper and straw proposal. Um, the second major element was uh, relating to an asymmetrical uh, wheeling settlement that we identified. Um, essentially, the issue is that uh, when there is a wheeling transaction through an EIM BAA, and one of the BAAs has a power balance constraint violation, it can cause an asymmetrical settlement. And so in this initiative, we're proposing to um, implement a tariff change uh, to, one, require that all EIN BAAs settle their ACTSR schedule deviations, and two, to specifically settle them at scheduling point tie prices, uh, so the prices of importing and exporting energy are the same. Uh, the third major element relates to the unaccounted for energy settlement. Um, and so this isn't so much of an issue as it is that we're trying to solve as it is an enhancement, um, but the ISO thinks that it is beneficial to allow 
EIM BAAs to derive their load indirectly using their generation and inner time meters to choose not to have the CAISO calculate and settle their unaccounted for energy. And so those are the three major elements of the issue paper and strap proposal. And uh, now on slide, uh, next slide please, now on slide seven, um, we uh, did receive stakeholder comments in response to our issue paper strap proposal. Um, and the, um, the major highlights, um, we did receive one additional metric uh, to consider from stakeholders that we will be uh, talking about in this presentation and we uh, posted or uh, included in our draft final proposal uh, related to uh, unscheduled flows. And so James Lynn will talk more about that later in the presentation. Um, stakeholders asked for additional description of the settlement me mechanics associated with their choice uh, whether or not to settle the unaccounted for energy. And so we hosted a stakeholder call on September 29th and posted a, a series of examples related to the settlement mechanics of settling or not settling the unaccounted for energy. And at that stakeholder call, we walked through uh, those examples. Uh, so hopefully stakeholders found that, <coughs> those examples and that uh, that call helpful. Um, and the third major item we, uh, in terms of comments were uh, that entities believe that, that CAISO should uh, publish the metrics data so that uh, stakeholders can, um, you know, see it and, uh, uh, you know, use it in their own analyses, and et cetera. So next slide, please. Um, so that brings us to sort of the, the major changes in the draft final proposal. This is slide eight. Um, so there's, uh, the way I see it, there's sort of four um, changes that we, or changes or enhancements that we made in the draft final proposal. Um, so one is uh, that we will consider an additional real-time settlement metric um, in response to those stakeholder comments. Um, and so, again, we'll go over what that is in more detail later. Uh, the draft final proposal describes the CAISO's commitment to publishing the metrics created for this initiative um, in response to stakeholder feedback. Um, so we'll also be talking about that in this, uh, in this call. Uh, we expanded upon our example of the asymmetrical wheeling settlement um, specifically to clarify how the optional settlement of base ETSR schedule deviation uh, exacerbates the cost shifting. So in our issue paper and strap proposal, uh, the examples that we provided and the, and the illustrations related to that example um, did not cover specifically, you know, what, what it looks like uh, when two EIMBAs are settling their schedule deviations bilaterally. And so we included an additional example in the draft final proposal to make it more clear what kind of impacts that has. And the fourth thing is that we are proposing um, an additional settlement change to the calculation that adjusts the allocation of real-time bid cost recovery uplift to account for EIM transfers. and. Uh, I will uh, describe in more detail later in the presentation uh, the justification for that and, and what the, uh, the change entails. Next slide, please. Um, so I think uh, at this moment I should uh, pause if anybody has any high-level questions or comments related to um, the material I just presented, and then we'll go into more detail with the relevant changes. Okay, so if you do have a question, press pound two. And Ethan, let me know if anybody enters the queue. All right, so far we have no questions in queue. I'll go ahead and give it another moment. 
Once again, pressing pound two will place you into the question queue. All right, there appears to be no questions coming through in the queue. Okay. Okay, so um, I will uh, hand it over to James Wynn to present um, on the first set of slides. Okay, everybody. Um, this is James Lynn. Um, in relationship to this initiative, as well as the Real Time Settlement Neutrality Initiative, um, T, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric um, had submitted a, a white paper um, that identified the, a potential issue um, that they wanted us to consider. Um, this issue is, or this um, concern has to do with loop flow and inadvertent flow. Um, within the ISO, when we first um, designed to have unaccounted for energy, um, since the ISO has distribution load meters, um, when we are accounting for the flow of energy, any differences of the um, energy that flowed in relationship to energy at schedule shows up as unaccounted for energy. Now, as we expand the EIM, uh, the concern that came was raised was, what if that energy um, is originating at a balancing authority area uh, associated with the EIM on the boundary of the EIM? Are we accounting for that cost correctly? Is there a cost shift that um, is being borne by one balance authority area or another because of this inadvertent energy flow or loop flow. So what we have, after reviewing the proposal, what um, we're looking to do is we're going to create uh, an analytic. We're just basically going to analyze the concern to see two things. One is the magnitude of the difference between the net scheduled interchange flow against the net scheduled interchanges. So whatever was the next schedule versus the actual flow. Um, and then we will look to apply uh, um, system marginal energy price plus relevant greenhouse gas if it's between um, two EIM BAAs and not going to the ISO. And based upon this analysis will determine is there really um, a concern on cost shift. The second thing that we have to look at for related to this is the difference between the two methodologies of calculating load. Is the top-down approach already accounting for this difference when it comes to load versus the bottom up, which is using distribution level meters. And so based upon this analysis, we're going to make a determination if we really have an issue. If we do have an issue, we'll create a metrics um, that we'll present to everybody. Um, but regardless, based upon our analytics, we will, as one of the MPPF meetings, is present our findings and make a decision if there is something that needs to be a, a stakeholder for a future um, fix in, in the subsequent year, uh, periods. Uh, any questions on this? So again, if you have a question, press pound two. And pg and &E, if I did not, if I missed anything, please let me know. Ethan, do we have anybody in the queue? At this time, there are no questions in the verbal queue. Well, let's just give it another uh, moment. Again, press pound two if you have a question. No questions? No questions. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what we have committed to. We have um, three metrics currently. Um, we are going to commit to presenting them to the participants um, through the market performance 
um, form as well as the market performance catalog. Uh, the second of the two metrics is already there. Um, we'll, what we'll do is we'll identify which of the current metrics that have been presented in these catalogs um, in essence covers that second metric, the um, is comparison of the offsets. Um, now, the first metric is going to be related to imbalance energy and financial value settlement. Um, these are, uh, well, actually the third one's already there, sorry. Uh, it, it, these are going to look at each balance authority area's um, instructions based upon the market, what was the settlement dollars, the relationship to financial value, we're trying to determine right now what is the best method to present this to you. Um, uh, my current methodology that I present to myself may not be the most appropriate. Um, in the um, uh, in the paper, or, or in, we will present these options, or what we have decided is going to be the best option for you at one of the forums, and then one, um, based from that point forward, we will continue to present this um, at least once a year. Uh, the second metric is that real-time congestion where we compare where the congestion materialized to where the congestion um, is being allocated to. Um, we will still go forward with this particular initiative or this particular metric, and um, I believe it's pretty straightforward what our current uh, design will be adequate for uh, the participants, but we're going to have some internal discussions to make sure there isn't some other information you may need. Um, as I said, the metric three, which is a real-time uh, offset comparison, those are already there. Um, we, they are figures uh, 173 and 174 in the uh, catalog. So we don't believe it's necessary to um, present them again. Um, so we just need you to look at those um, when you're looking at the real-time offsets. And as I stated before, the other metric which we're looking at, we'll see if it's needed first before we um, commit to presenting it. Thanks, James. So that's, that's all we have for the metric slides. Any questions? Again, press pound two. We do have a question in the queue. Great. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hi, this is James. This is Ken Lyons with APS. Um, quick Hi, question. Ken. You know, hey, how's it going? We were did review those uh, figures 173 and 174, and we're just wondering, you know, overall, you know, not just for those, but for all the metrics, you know, are you going to make like the underlying data to those figures available? Because like the figures themselves weren't, you know, super overly helpful. Like, are we going to be able to dig into the the numbers behind that for, you know, our own use a little bit more? Or did you have any thoughts about that? Um, yeah, the underlying data you should already have access to. Um, this underlying data is in the, um, I, the ISO or the balancing authority area uh, build determinant files. Um, and, and so they are available for you to uh, retrieve. It's just making sure that your general settlement system actually pulls it in. Um, and if we need be, um, I can identify the bill determinant for you um, so that you can uh, make sure your vendor pulls this information in. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that was our only concern is oftentimes when we, you know, start looking at those bill determinants, it just, you know, it becomes a pretty time-intensive effort to try to pull that data. And so, you know, we're just thinking if, you know, some – you know, the data that you already pulled could be made available to just kind of ease that burden, but just a thought. We'll take that back under uh, and talk about it. Um, and it's just a matter of presenting the same data in three, uh, two or three different 
uh, forums or formats, um, it can be uh, a little bit daunting. So we'll take that back and, and take that into consideration. Thanks, sir. All right, thanks, Ken. Any other questions, Ethan? At this time, there are no further questions in the queue. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on then. Okay. All right, back to James. Policy, James. So I'm going to go over in this set of slides the, uh, the example that we expanded on related to the asymmetrical wheeling settlement. Um, and so uh, first, let's back up and revisit this illustration here. Um, and so what we have is um, energy that is flowing uh, from uh, non-EIM BA1 in the upper left corner, uh, wheeling through three EIM BAAs, and then sinking in non-EIM BAA3. Okay, so um, in this example, we are assuming that prices are formed one of two ways, uh, one with the, well, I should say with two components. One is the system marginal energy cost, which is represented by lambda, which is the same uh, for all BAAs. And then there's a lambda subscript that's specific to each BAA that represents if there is a power balance constraint violation, uh, the, the sort of penalty price for that. And so um, this example doesn't uh, include losses or congestion in the pricing, just to make it as simple as possible. Okay. So what we've done in this example compared to the examples uh, that we posted in the issue paper and strap proposal is that we essentially have erased the pricing related to the transaction between EIMBA2 and EIM. BA5. And what that represents is instead of settling those prices uh, through or settling that transaction through the market with predefined prices, uh, uh, we're assuming that those transactions are settled bilaterally outside of the market. And so therefore they're sort of hidden in this example. Okay, so um, let's move on to the next slide, please. So here's the, you have the same illustration here, but now we've sort of breaking out in this table sort of how the energy flow or the settlement uh, will flow. So the assumption here is that BAA2, the middle BAA, uh, has a power balance constraint violation and a related uh, penalty price of $500. So you can see in the upper portion of the table that the system marginal energy cost is the same for all EIM BAAs. Um, because of the power balance constraint violation, the LMP in BA2 is $500 more than the LMP in the other two BAAs. And so we can sort of walk through uh, how this settles. Um, so we're considering at 100 megawatts of flow here. Um, so 100 megawatts in this transaction. Um, so Starting from the top, or starting from the upper left corner, um, the import into BAA4 for 100 megawatts gets settled at a $30 price for $3,000 total settlement. Then the export from EIM BAA4, uh, because of the way that it's priced, uh, which essentially is the midpoint between the price in BAA4 and the price in BAA2, um, they, they get charged uh, $28,000 for that export. And the import into BA2 is uh, paid the same amount, so that settles out just fine. Uh, but now the, the transaction between BA2 and BA5 uh, does not settle through the market, um, and therefore uh, we have some impacts related to um, uh, cost shifting essentially that shows up in this real-time congestion offset. Um, so the, um, the real-time congestion offset for BAA2 um, is 
negative $3,000, and for BAA 5 is $3,000. Um, and that's needed in order to um, sort of uh, maintain the neutrality of that settlement there. Um, and James, if you have anything to add that I missed, um, feel free to jump in. And you may be on mute if you're talking. Nope, all good. Okay. Um, and so, so really, the purpose of the purpose of including this example is um, to demonstrate that um, the the cost shifting occurs not only because um, in the current met or the current method, the import and export prices between the BAs are not always consistent. Um, in which this initiative proposes to make them consistent, um, but also that the, the optional settlement sort of makes the cost shifting issue worse um, by introducing, uh, you know, other types of offsets and neutrality payments that need to uh, cover, um, you know, payments that are not seen in the market. Yeah. Um, so, so go ahead, James. Well, I was just going to finish by saying that, you know, this uh, there's no additional there's no additional proposal um, that I'm I'm uh, talking up here. It's just simply to expand the example. Go ahead. Um, all I was going to add was um, one of the the reasons why this example is so good. It uh, works so well is if you um, remove the import and export portion of this example and you see it as internal EIM generation serving another EIM load and using the transfers, and one BAA agrees to settle it as part of a bilateral and the other one decided that they want to settle it as part of the dynamic, it creates a cost shift um, between the BAAs that um, should not be there. And so this emphasizes one of the needs to have um, only base ETSRs, allowing a base schedule on base ETSRs. Um, then we can ensure that the balancing authority areas start off the real-time market on the same um, playing field and we don't have this cost shift. Okay, so we'll go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, if anybody has questions on this example, please press pound two to raise your hand. Do we have anybody in the queue, Ethan? At this time, we have no questions in the queue. Today. Yeah, I figured that might be. Yeah, I figured that might be something that stakeholders were relatively comfortable with, and we did in our issue paper and straw proposal uh, mention that you know the the non-settlement or the optional settlement makes it worse, but we just didn't describe exactly how it was. So. So we'll shift to the next topic then, which is um, sort of our third proposed change in this initiative. And, uh, you know, essentially how this change came about is that when we uh, we were asked by stakeholders to sort of provide more detail around uh, this optional unaccounted for energy settlement, you know, uh, what does it mean if I settle? What does it mean if I don't? How does that, how does that all work? Um, and in doing that, uh, in, in, and in combination with stakeholder comments at that call, um, we decided that to revisit this BCR transfer um, calculation. Now, taking a step back, um, we, we have a calculation in our tariff to adjust um, the cost allocation for real-time uh, big cost recovery uplift 
based on EIM transfers. And that adjustment calculation is there in the first bullet of this slide. Um, and so in that calculation, we consider, um, and, and I guess I should mention, this is specifically uh, as an adjustment for um, an EIMBA with a net transfer out. So there's a different calculation with a, with a net transfer in, um, but just to make it simple, we'll focus on net transfers out. Um, so this, this equation considers uh, the transfers, but it also considers unaccounted for, unaccounted for energy and also uninstructed um, imbalance energy. Um, and so we're putting together this example and, and uh, are putting together the examples for UFB and other stakeholders commented about the BCR transfers. We decided that maybe it was time to relook at this adjustment. And so what we did is sort of we, we, we brought it back to sort of the cost causation principles of real-time BCR. And we had, the KISO had explored recently in a, um, the BCR enhancements initiative that concluded in 2017, the principles of real-time uh, BCR cost allocation. And in that, in that initiative, the KISO concluded that allocating real-time BCR according to cost causation is, is really difficult because the market commits units in real time for a lot of different reasons. And um, specifically in that initiative, the KISO concluded that um, the real time big cost recovery cost allocation um, should not necessarily be driven by imbalance, uh, uninstructed imbalance energy. Um, because again, the, a lot of times the reasons for uh, needing to commit a unit in real time um, overlap with each other. Um, and also, it, although it wasn't specifically mentioned in that initiative, uh, we also don't think that it's appropriate for um, that it's appropriate for unaccounted for energy to be considered in this calculation as well, because um, unaccounted for energy is sort of a post-market accounting, and the market, the real-time market, does not uh, commit units um, based on unaccounted for energy. And so, uh, what we propose instead is. You know, based on that initiative, we conclude, the KISO concluded that, you know, real-time bid cost recovery should then generally be allocated to load and export um, because, you know, they are the beneficiaries of uh, the unit commitment in real time. So, you know, instead of having the transfer or the uh, adjustment equation in the top bullet, we're proposing to make it uh, 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 the bottom bullet there, which uh, instead of uh, instead of having uh, unaccounted for energy and imbalance energy in there, the the, the adjustment would be based on uh, load and exports and transfers, and that essentially just means that we're considering uh, the uh, EIM transfers as part of um, the the category of exports, essentially. And so we think this is a, a more, uh, you know, just and reasonable allocation of cost for real-time bid cost recovery, um, especially, you know, given the proposed change here that, um, you know, the unaccounted for energy may uh, be optionally settled. And so that could also create some, um, you know, could also create some issues. So. I'll ask James if there's anything I left out of that explanation. The, the only thing I would add is um, one of the reasons why we looked at doing this was when a resource is being dispatched, there's many reasons. Um, some it could be for economic reasons, some could be for outages associated with base load. Others could be because you dispatch it to serve another balancing authority area. So when you are doing all these dispatch decisions, um, it's hard to know exactly why a specific generator 
um, is uneconomically dispatched, which, which exact reason it is. So what we determined was that, in essence, it's to serve demand. So by modifying the, this equation to align with the real-time um, uh, BCR enhancement initiative, we are now accounting for all scenarios of why a resource was dispatched within the real-time market um, in order to serve either base load or incremental or decremental load, or demand, sorry, base demand or incremental or decremental demand. Okay. Thanks, so let's go ahead and, yeah, let's go ahead and open it up for questions. Again, press pound two if you want to raise your hand. We do have a question in the queue. Caller, you are unmuted. Please go ahead. Hey, James, Ken Lyons, Candid APS. Um, just to, I think I have a two-part question for this. Um, first, since this is a full market change, um, was there going to be any clarification to when this is released in fall 2021 if there's going to be any retroactive resettlements? or is it just going to be a moving forward? The, the, the UFC and the BCR would be a moving forward uh, aspect um, because it is a change to um, the FERC-approved tariff and uh, ISO policy. Um, so there is no retroactive uh, aspect of this particular uh, part of the initiative. Um, the asymmetrical will be, we're currently putting the design in now, um, so we will have a portion of it will start uh, on 1-1, one, one, and the other portion starts on 4-1 of 2021. Okay. Yeah, I have a question on that. I'll, I'll clarify that when we get there. Um, or maybe, yeah, so, so, for the, so for the asymmetrical wheeling then, you're going to retro, because originally it was, that was another question, it was 10-1 was the retroactive. Now you're going to change that to a 1-1 one, one retroactive because it goes live in April? Yeah, well, actually, we're – so the the settlement design, we are going to be based upon the affidavits, will go active as a 1-1. One, one. The tariff uh, support for um, the mandatory settlement of base UTSRs and the mandatory creation of base UTSRs will be starting 4-1. So between the period of 1-1 and 4-1, we're using the affidavits to uh, initiate the change. Um, and then we'll use this to be for the permanent change um, going forward. Okay, but there won't, because initially there was talk about a resettlement period um, for the asymmetrical wheeling, so. So there won't be a resettlement period that will be live. And, yeah, and the reason being, and, I, and I'll give a little bit of history, the reason being is pricing. Um, we are had to make a modification in the market software to get the unique pricing, uh, scheduling for tie pricing for these base ETSRs, and um, the code associated with that will not be available until closer to 1-1, one, one, and, and therefore we can't retroactively do it because I can't rerun the market. Okay, thank you. And then moving back to this uh, transfer ratio adjustment, I think we, we have a, you know, we really appreciate you guys um, looking at this and, you know, coming up with a proposed change. We think that was a great effort. Um, but we're, we're curious about, you know, this same ratio applies in other allocation charges, flex ramp and measured demand allocations. Is there a reason why those weren't addressed or are there plans to address those or um, any thoughts on that? So this transfer ratio was at one point uh, applied for the real-time imbalance energy offset. Um, however, with the real-time uh, neutrality initiative, we eliminated um, that transfer mechanism. Um, there isn't 
uh, transfer mechanism in the flexible ramp. So the only uh, one that we had to address was the BCR. And so that's why we went a deep dive uh, comparison into this, a look into this, and tried to make sure we aligned it with the, uh, the uh, post BCR enhancement. Great, thanks. And then um, one last question on the, the asymmetrical uh, go live. Are, are you going to provide any more like timeline details on the, the price mapping of when you're going to release those? Because I understand you're going to update the master file, but, you know, I guess the challenge for, you know, some of, you know, other entities is, you know, we, our internal systems are going to need to be updated, you know, for how we, you know, sub-allocate EIM charges. And so, you know, we need some time to, to make those changes on our internal systems. So are, are you going to come out with like a more, you know, detailed timeline about, you know, releasing that pricing information and is there going to be any type of like market sim or anything for us to, to test our systems? Well, I'm glad you asked that last part. We are currently market simming it. Um, in November um, and December, we will be performing, I think it's November 12th it starts. I'd have to double check. But we are market, market simming the asymmetrical wheeling changes. Um, and, and that is to support the 1-1 one, one implementation. And that implementation is, that at that point, there will be no more, there will be no additional configuration changes for settlements or master file. Um, the only thing that we have to take care of is the tariff, and now needs to be in alignment with what we would be current, what we are going to be doing for the asymmetric weaving as part of the fall release or the winter release. And, and so with that, are, are we going to be able to see those? I'm just not too versed in the master yeah. file. We're going to be able to see those master file changes. That way we can um, look, look at our internal changes. Yeah, sorry. I should, yeah, if you're looking at market sim now, you should be able to see where, what the pricing location and what the um, pricing uh, mechanism is. Great. Thank you. That, that's all I had. I'm chatty Kathy today. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> I blame Great. Christina. Any she said everybody was quiet. <laughs> Any other questions, Ethan? There are no further questions in the queue. Okay, uh, so let's go on to the next step. Um, so uh, for the EIM body, governing body classification, uh, what the ISO is proposing is that for the um, settlement changes for asymmetrical wheeling and the unaccounted for energy, that uh, the EIM governing body have primary authority over those two um, changes, and then for the VCR, transfer change that the, um, they would have advisory role. Uh, but we do ask um, the stakeholders, if you have any input into these classifications, that you include those in your written comments, uh, which leads me to my next slide. Uh, so we are asking for written comments on the draft final proposal. Um, we do have a, a template out on the initial webpage that's um, uh, through our new commenting tool, so please use that template to submit your comments, uh, linked here on the page. Um, uh, so again, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I don't know if uh, all of you were on the call, we are going to be kicking off the tariff process for this initiative. Um, we're going to be posting draft tariff language in uh, the first week of November, uh, which is next week, um, and then we will ask for stakeholders to provide written comments. Um, and then we'll host a stakeholder call uh, to go over those comments, and that'll be um, in mid-November. So once we have the details um, of that process, we're going to go ahead and issue a public notice um, with the call information and um, a link to where to find the tariff language. So do we have any other questions? Again, press pound two. Nothing? We do have one question that came through. Caller, you okay. are unmuted. Please go ahead. Go ahead, caller. 
Michael Sorry, Bannon, I'm you. This is this is Ken Lyons again at APS. Hello, Ken. It's really okay. chatty today. <laughs> That's um, all right. I didn't know if we were going to get to the UFE option still. Um, I guess you know, are we addressing that or the option to settle or not settle? I just, we had a, a really brief comment on that. This, this is James. Um, we, we're happy to take questions on that. I, I didn't put it in the slides um, only because we didn't really propose any, any changes between the straw proposal and the, the final proposal, um, but we're happy to take questions about it. Yeah, I, I guess ours is a more kind of just a, you know, um, would like a little bit more, I mean, we're, we're aligned and really like the option. Um, but as far as implementation goes, you know, we, you know, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, there's, there's going to be impacts, right, to our settlements, obviously, you know, depending on the entity, the frequency of over under scheduling charges and the charge itself, you know, cost shifting between UIE and neutrality charge codes, which ultimately get, you know, sub allocated, you know, and then the kind of flex ramp um, issues as well and BCR. And, and so, you know, it's just really hard for, you know, us to gauge, you know, the net impact to our, our settlements on that. And so we were wondering, you know, there wasn't really anything in in the proposal about, you know, what the implementation of this is going to look like. You know, are, are entities going to be given, like, you know, either, you know, a, an estimated impact from historical settlements or is there going to be, like, a time frame where, you know, you can, you know, choose, you know, not to settle, but then if you, you know, if you see unintended impacts or it was impacting other areas you, you hadn't foreseen, are we going to be able to, you know, go back to, you know, settling or, you know, so any kind of grace period or, you know, is it going to be something you elect to do and you have to stick with it or, you know, what, has there been any thought put, put forth to that? So, um, with regards to um, the process, I'm going to address some of that. Uh, so, once we get to the point where um, we're moving forward, with clearly right now, is we'll go through the, the business requirement specifications. We'll start addressing some of those um, topics there, um, but there is no proposal to have a grace period. Um, what, we'll, what we were planning on doing is putting in the fall release, establishing a market sim, and then based on that market sim, you participate and you can see what the uh, changes potentially would be um, from potentially comparing it from, you know, your market sim statement maybe to your production statement using the same information. Um, now, when it comes to the election period, um, it, we're trying to, to develop, or we will develop what that process is to notify the ISO what your election is and um, how many, you know, if you wanted to change it every month, then you'd have to do it like seven days ahead of time. You know, we're going to try to put it in a master file. Um, but that, that is going to be part of the implementation is we're going to uh, figure out where is that information going to be maintained and then we'll, we will address how often we should allow the election to occur. Um, and, and maybe we'll put that as part of the tariff as well. I mean, once a year or if it's, if it's just straight election, it's going to be ongoing. It, we're going to talk about the tariff language on the frequency of the election. I hadn't, I hadn't considered it to being once a year. I was considering it more as as it uh, you you need it to be and maintaining it in a master file. But that's something we can discuss. Great, thanks. That information. Now, thanks a lot. Yeah, so remember, this is be fall of next year, so you'll, we will have a, a full market sim set up for it. Excellent, thanks. Thanks, Ken. Any other questions, Ethan? Yes, we do have another question in the queue. Okay. Call, you were unmuted. Please go ahead. 
Hi, this is Jennifer Gerard at Idaho Power. Um, I just kind of wanted to follow up on what Ken said, um, kind of, I guess, maybe more specific to the market simulation. I know it's a little bit early, but um, just a thought with market sim, it seems like with some of these initiatives where you're, you want to kind of compare what's happening in production versus what's going to happen, let's say, if we, you know, stop settling UFB. And I don't know if there's a possibility or a con um, that Kaiso can consider for market sim to actually just take an entity's actual production statements or one's historical production statements, turn, uh, turn off the settlement of UFB and allow us just to see those statements to compare them against an actual production statement because it seems like I think with market sim, um, at least my experience, which is very limited, is that sometimes you don't have maybe all the data that lines up with what you would have on production. So I don't know if that's a possibility or a consideration that you guys could look at. I think it would allow us to really be able to make that determination um, a little bit easier. Yeah, what we can do is as part of the development of the market sim, particularly the scenarios, we can um, talk about that. Um, and uh, I'll raise it to the P uh, our project management group as to the, uh, this is a concern. And we'll, we'll address that during the uh, development of the market sim um, timeline. And maybe we will uh, consider something different, um, but I, I will have to take it back to the project manager because we will have other initiatives going coming on at the same time, and so we have to manage all of that. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, Jennifer. Mm -hmm. And Ken and Jennifer, if you can um, also document this in your written comments, that would be great. So any other questions in the queue, Ethan? At this time, there are no further questions in the queue. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Greatly appreciate it, and enjoy the rest of your, your day. Thanks, Ethan. Of course. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using AT&T Event Conferencing Enhanced. You may now disconnect.